to Stony Wren and we're planning on coming as soon as that was over. Um, so hopefully some more will be coming in to join us. But you are here and we are glad that you're here and looking forward to what the Lord is going to do in this service this evening. Let's stand to our feet. We want to go to the Lord in prayer and ask that his presence will be here tonight. It's so good to see so many guests from different churches and different places and different ministers. Thank you all for being here. Just give everybody a good hand clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we just come before you tonight. We thank you for your word that we're going to be hearing in just a little while. We thank you, God, for the choice servant that you have sent us tonight. Lord, I know he's going to preach like a man from another world, anointed with an anointing that comes out of another world. Lord, I just pray that you would minister through him tonight. Lord, I pray that he would just be able to push down every barrier of the Spirit, that the Word of God would magnify Jesus. Lord, you said if you would be lifted up, that you would draw all men unto you. Lord, I just pray that you would draw people, draw hearts, draw souls into your kingdom tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we give ourselves tonight to worship you. We give ourselves over for worship. Lord, nothing that we are doing here is about entertainment. We're not trying to entertain a soul. Lord, we just want to entertain your presence, and we want your spirit to be welcome. So, Lord, help us to join together tonight to worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I would tell you to take your church hymnal and turn to page 88, but all of the church hymnals are in the fellowship hall. So we've got plenty of gospel hymnals, but um, I'm going that way is not in the gospel hymnal. Whoever wrote the gospel hymnal was not going that way. <laughs> so it took some good Church of God man to say that he was going that way. But take your, Anna, do we have that in our song select? All righty. It may not be sanctified enough to have that song, but it should. Oh, okay. Too well. I've I've been educated. That's right. <laughs> Two ninety. That's right. Two ninety one. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. The gospel hymnal folks are going that way.
him tonight. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just lift our hands all over this house. Let's begin to worship the Lord tonight. God, we just welcome you in this house. Lord, we worship you tonight. We come expecting you to move, God. We don't need a song to worship you, Lord. We just have our hearts, Lord, our lips, our hands, God, and we lift you up tonight. We lift up the name of Jesus Christ in this house. We welcome you, Lord, and you're worthy of praise tonight. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, Lord, we welcome you. it on my own. I can't do it by myself. Lord, I need you tonight. Revive us, Lord. Fill 
Alléluia. Alléluia. Worship you, Lord. Alleluia. 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 Are you thankful for his blood tonight? Come on, lift your hands all over this house. Begin to thank him. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for saving me, Lord. I thank you for your blood. I thank you for the stripes you bore for my sins, for my healing, Lord. I thank you tonight, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood from Emmanuel's face.
worship you tonight, Lord. We worship you tonight, Lord. We give you praise. All over this house right now, if you will, I just want you to do something. Just close your eyes with me. Close your eyes with me. I want you to eliminate the distractions around you. Forget about what you got going on at home, what you got going on tomorrow. Just think about what Jesus has done for you. We come to think about Him and worship Him tonight. Hallelujah. If we'll put our focus on Him, everything else becomes real small because we serve a real big God. And He's done a lot of great things for us. And I thank you tonight, Lord. I worship you tonight, Lord. You're worthy tonight, Jesus. I give you praise, Lord. You're worthy, Jesus. setting that up for him. Um, he's going to play there tonight, and uh, but we are so thrilled to have him. I didn't realize, now this, there's few people that can out-preach this man right here. This is a preaching machine, and um, one of the words that would come to mind to describe Stacy Watford is just pure brilliance, but I did not know that he could also play the piano and sing. That's the kind of stuff that I calls me have to fight envy when I hear people that can preach like this and play and sing. And so, but we're excited tonight to get to hear him and um, his beautiful daughter is going to be singing with him as well. But ushers, I want you to come. Let's get ready to wait on the people for their evening tithes and offering. We believe that this is as much part of worship as anything else that will take place tonight is giving in the offering to bless the man of God, the ministry that he has. You've heard me say it many times before. 
But I just believe that if we will take care of the evangelist and the missionary, that God will take care of the home church. That it is our job to take care of the evangelist and the missionary. And they are spreading the word in places that we cannot spread it. And when we invest in them, we take part of their reward. The Bible tells us that those who give a prophet or give a, a prophet a glass of water in the name of a prophet, they receive that reward. And so we want to bless this man of God. I don't believe that he's talking so much about physical water as he's talking about putting the juice in them to keep them going. If he were living today, he might say, if you give a prophet a tank of gas in the name of a prophet, or pay his bills that you receive, you become part of that reward. And so I want us to bless this man of God tonight. And all I'm asking you to do is to ask the Lord what he would have you to give and then be obedient to that. And as you have heard me say many times before, that God has never asked me to do something that did not stretch me. It was something that would not be an easement. It was something that would take faith to do it. So if an amount comes to your mind and you say, oh, that's easy. I got that dollar in my pocket. That wasn't the Lord. But if an amount comes to your mind and you say, are you sure? That was the one that came from him. That one that made you say, are you sure? That was the one that came from him. So, Lord, we ask you tonight to speak to our heart that that we would have to, that you would have us to give. Lord, we want to take part in this man of God's ministry. We want to take part in what he's doing for you so that our dollars are pushing the gospel message, not just in Lake City, South Carolina, but, Lord, in all parts of the country, wherever he goes, we'll have part in that. And, Lord, I pray tonight that you would bless us as we give. Speak to us what we are to give. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen and amen. Brother Stacy is going to play and sing. And after they are through, the next voice you will hear will be that of our evangelist, Brother Vic Snyder. How many of you are thankful to be in a Pentecostal church tonight? Amen. One reason I love this place is because it preaches Pentecost. He pushes Pentecost. And I'm so glad for the moving of the Spirit of the living God. Amen. I have been to a lot of churches, a lot of places. Let me tell you something. Some of them are so as dry and dead. God, to help us all, we need the power of the Holy Ghost in this place. Because some churches... All of them sound, some of them, some of them sound like this. You can have the greatest choir dressed in long white robe attire. You can have a wall full of trophies showing off that softball team. Oh, but if the people aren't praying, come on, that's how many stay Cause there ain't no one going up on no water town gasoline. You know what we need? Anybody know what we need tonight? What we need is a soul filling station. A 24 service open day. Popping that high octane super salvation. Fast get away. You can always find a steeple, a few religious people. Well, there's a preacher on the front steps shaking everybody's hand. A sign said like a Bible saying summer revival. But watch this. There's a million dead churches just filling up an acre of land. A full service open 24 hours a day. Pumping that high octane super salvation. Where a heart out of gas can fill up on that fast get away. Where that heart out of gas can fill up on that fast get away. Give the Lord praise in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you realize tonight?
here. There she is. How, how many of you realize tonight she's going to redeem me now, okay? That, uh, that we need the Holy Ghost in this place. We need the power of the Holy Ghost in this place. And let's just prepare our hearts tonight just to receive the Word of God by the man of God tonight. And let's just worship the Lord tonight. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come and reign on us. Holy Spirit. Spirit, Holy Spirit, come and reign on us. Make it your prayer. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come and reign on us. Holy
presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. place tonight. Aren't you glad to be in God's house? Yeah. On, on a cool, if not slash cold, wet, if not real rainy, I don't know what it's doing out there right now, maybe it's 70 degrees, um, <laughs> somewhere, <laughs> but not, not in Lake City, South Carolina. Maybe it's a drought somewhere, but not in Lake City, South Carolina, but the Lord is blessing us on, yeah. a, on a cool, dreary on the outside Monday evening and we're just so glad that you're here. Thanks for being a part of the service this evening. I trust you had a good day. I trust you've been talking to Jesus throughout this day that, that tonight is not the first time that you've come into his presence and, and at least said hello but that you have spent some time with him throughout this day and I'm just delighted. I appreciate so much everyone being here. All of the uh, folks from this local church and those who are guests from other places we're just thrilled that you're here god bless you and uh, it's always a delight whenever i have ministers to come from other places contrary to what a lot of folks think about us preachers uh we don't sit home every night saying dear god would you help us think of something to do you know, mo most of the time we've got a list at, that uh, is a leftover list from last week the things we didn't get done and so we're just trying and trying, and I appreciate so very much when ministers come and they worship together with us, and we just pray the Lord's blessing upon them. And those who, I understand that, that I've never gone, personally, I've never gone live on Facebook. How many of you have ever done that? I, I, I never have done that. I, I don't know that I, I could figure it out, I suppose, but I don't know that I could just get my iPad and immediately push the right button to make it happen. But I understand that, that there's a possibility some folks may be uh, worshiping with us on Facebook Live. All right, and so it's not Saturday Night Live, it's Monday Night Live. And, and we're glad that, uh, that they're worshiping with us. And, and may the Lord just bless them that others will, will be able to watch these kind of things later. Isn't it great that God has chosen you and me to be able to serve him in this day of high technology? I mean, I, our forefathers, didn't, they never dreamed that they'd be able to preach from, from one place and then later and later and later they'd still be able to be heard because of the, the wonderful technology that's available. And I, I'm so grateful. So we welcome all of those who are with us by way of the Internet and Facebook and, and Snapchat. And I, don't, I don't do Snapchat. I don't know anything about it. I'm just trying to think of other other things that they do and Instagram. I don't do Instagram. I've got a I've got an at whatever, but I, I don't know much about all that. But I do know it's a privilege for me to be able to be here in person with you. You're making me feel welcome. You're making me feel at home. If you don't intend for me to feel like I'm enjoying myself, you're messing up because I really am enjoying being here and worshiping the name of the Lord with you. I appreciate so much the folks across this country who helped me do the work of an evangelist. There are those because of my designation as the National Evangelist for the International Pentecostal Holiness Church with the blessing of Bishop Chris Thompson and his EVUSA Council. Uh, they, they have uh, allowed people to be able to support the work that I do as they do a missionary on foreign soil. And so I appreciate the fact that there are those across the country who uh, felt led of God to be able to help me to do that. And I mentioned that this evening because I have placed some cards out in your foyer this way and the foyer this way. If the Lord were to touch your heart, you would have any interest in knowing more about us and what we do and how we do it. And if the Lord would speak to you and you want to partner with us, we welcome that. And we just pray the Lord's blessings upon you. So that's my spiel tonight. All right. That's what you get out of me. I spend very little time talking about my need of support and my need of whatever. 
God has promised to supply all of my need according to his riches in glory. And I told you last night while I was preaching to you, I've got a dollar bill. It's folded in half and it's there in my office where God gave me his promise that he would take care of my needs one dollar at a time. And he's doing just that. And I thank the Lord for people across the country whose uh, hearts have been touched by his hand as have mine. And they're helping me to do this. And we just pray the Lord's blessings upon you. Thank you, Pastor, again for the invitation that brings me here and for all that you have done to be able to schedule me in other places. I cannot thank you enough. I am sincerely and will forevermore be grateful to you for such kindness and such a, a, a hospitable and generous spirit that, that, that you possess. And I'm grateful to you. Amen. I want to read to you from the Old Testament book of Judges. I want to present to you some... Uh, preaching about an Old Testament patriarch by the name of Samson. Who's ever heard of Samson? Anybody? You, you've heard of his story. I want to preach to you a little bit about him tonight, the Lord helping us. If you'll turn to Judges chapter number 16, I want to read from verse number 28. Judges 16, verse number 28. If you would stand, please, we'll honor the word of the Lord. We'll ask that he be pleased to anoint his servant. We know that this book is anointed. I'm convinced that a drunk could quote scripture and there's power in it, all right? Because in the king's word, there is power, all right? But I'm not drunk tonight. I'm one of his kids, and so I'm trusting that he's going to anoint me. And that way, the speaker and the spoken word is anointed. And who can tell what God's going to do in this place tonight? Amen and amen. Judges, chapter 16, verse number 28. And uh, Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. When Samson is offering this prayer in the closing moments of his life, he is praying, God, would you touch me one more time? And that's the cry of our heart tonight. God, touch us one more time. Father, bless the reading of your word and touch your people that we together may hear what the Spirit has to say to your church. Anoint your servant and help me that I might be able to speak with the power and the unction that only comes when the Holy Ghost is touching an individual to declare your eternal message. Bless us and do your will. And we'll give you glory and praise in the name of the Lord Jesus, we ask. And everyone said amen, amen. and amen. The Lord bless you as you're seated this evening. You know well the story of, of Samson as it's recorded there in the book of Judges. The Bible teaches much about him. I probably won't get it all said. You'll be glad about that. But I want to tell you that there is so much to be said about Samson. When I read about Samson, I read about me. Whenever I see Samson, I see me. When I look into his story, I think, there am I as well. Now, the scripture says to us that Samson is a young man that came and he was born into a family of the Danites, the tribe of Dan. The scripture says to us that this boy was the answer, if you will, to the prayer of his parents. They wanted a child and God heard their prayer and granted their petition. I understand that Samson is a man of destiny. And you and I, we hear much about destiny today. We preach about destiny. We talk about destiny. We encourage people, pursue your destiny. Find out what your destiny is. I want to talk to you a couple of things tonight about destiny. First of all, your destiny comes directly from God. Your plan, the plan for your life and the thing that you'll do with your life, it comes directly from God. Go with me back now to the early times of where we read about Samson. And the Bible says to us that his parents, or Manoah is the dad. Mom doesn't have a name given in scripture, so she's Ms. Manoah for tonight. Manoah and Ms. Manoah, they're seeking God. They want a child, and they are barren. They have no offspring. But Manoah has 
gone to work one day. This is Snyder's loose translation, all right? Manoah goes to work one day, and while he's gone, Ms. Manoah has a visitor. It's the Lord's angel. And the angel comes to her and says, right now, you are barren, but soon you are going to bear a son. You are going to have not just a baby, but I'm telling you, before you even get pregnant, uh, you're going to have a man-child. It's going to be a little boy, and he is going to be a Nazarite unto God from your womb, which means uh, that that child is not going to drink strong drink, uh, and you you are not going to drink strong drink. You are going to live a certain way so that God's name will be exalted in the raising up and the life eventually of this young man by the name of Samson. What God's angel said was, if God's going to trust you to raise this Nazarite, then you're going to have to do some things, and you're going to have to refrain from doing some things. Let me just pause and tell you that if you and I are going to accomplish the plan of God in these last days, we have to come to the place that we are willing to do anything that God would ask us to do. Can somebody amen. say amen to that? We likewise must come to that place that we are willing to stop doing anything that God would ask us to stop doing. Now, years ago, I know a lot of folks, they'll laugh at our ancestors and our foreparents because because they stopped doing a lot of things and they did a lot of things that many of us today don't think are absolutely essential to salvation and going to heaven. But I want to tell you, you can't fault a man who would say, God, I'll do anything if that's what you want me to do. And you can't fault a woman who will say, God, I'll stop doing and I'll stop being and I'll stop whatever if that's what you want out of me. God, give us a heart that is willing to please him in every way. So Somebody say amen to that. Our destiny flows directly from God. And fulfilling the will of God in our life means that other people will be set free. That's why God was going to raise up Samson, was to be a deliverer. When Samson is fulfilling personal destiny, other people are experiencing the good things of God, namely their deliverance and liberation from the hell hand of the Philistines. The scripture continues telling us that not only does our destiny flow directly <clears throat> excuse me, from God, but it flows out of our devotion and our dedication to God. I'm convinced we ought to be devoted. Yeah. We ought to be dedicated yeah. to him. Now, the scripture says that this boy child is going to be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Here's your homework assignment for tonight. I won't read all this to you. But in the sixth chapter of the book of Numbers, about verse number 3 through 21 through there, you will find the, the requirements that God placed upon anyone who would be a Nazarite. Now, understand there's a difference in a Nazarite and a Nazarene, all right? A Nazarene has to do with location, while a Nazarite has to do with vocation. And this man is not from Nazareth. He is a Nazarene. Jesus was a Nazarene. He was not a Nazarite, okay? But the scripture says to us that this man is a Nazarite unto God from his mother's womb. There were basically three tenets of the requirements of a man who was a Nazarite. First off, he was to drink no strong drink, which means that he would be disciplined in those things that are appealing. Secondly, he was to have no association with dead bodies, which meant that he would be different in his associations. Thirdly, no razor was ever to come upon his hair, which says that he would be distinct in his appearance. We find this man, Samson, is born, and the Bible said that the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. Now, the Spirit moved upon him. God helped him, and God would touch him. Thank you so much. 
God would help him and cause him to be able to do things that, that he could not do in and of himself. He could not accomplish those things on his own. You'll find Samson at one point, he's destroying a lion. On another occasion, he kills 30 men, his adversaries. On another time, you'll find that he's setting barley fields on fire. You'll continue reading that he smites his enemy hip and thigh with a great slaughter. One time he kills a thousand with a jawbone of a donkey. On another occasion, he's coming out of Gaza and he pulls the gates up out of the ground and holds them over his shoulder. Some estimate that he ran about 40 miles. I see him throw the gates on the ground, do a jig and say, God has been good to me. The Lord has blessed me. It was only because of the goodness and the grace and the power of the Almighty that he was able to do the things that he did. Church, the only way we're going to get done the things that we're called upon to do this day is if we have an anointing of the Holy Ghost upon us. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. We need his touch in our lives one more time. You see, when God moves, powerful things happen. The adversary is confused, and the name of our great God is exalted and glorified. Now, notice something about Samson. He is a Nazarite, and he is coming under the attack of the adversary. Let me just pause and mention this. If you are going to operate with an anointing, you are going to operate with a target on your back. Because the adversary is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And those who are empowered and used by God, he that is the adversary will endeavor to take you out of the picture. Because if the standard bearer falls, then those following the standard bearer have no idea which direction to go. But we've got to have an anointing if it does mean that we'll come under attack. If it does mean that hell will be unleashed against us. If it does mean that every day and every noon and every night we'll have to fight the good fight of faith, then bring it on. Amen. Because we know we cannot operate in our flesh, for in our flesh dwells no good thing. We can only accomplish the plan and purpose and destiny of our God if we are anointed by his eternal spirit. But Samson came under attack. How many of you have ever had an attack by the devil? Amen. It's amazing who he can use to bring that attack. Sometimes it's folks that you love. Sometimes it's folks that you cook for. Sometimes it's folks that you bring the paycheck home to. Sometimes it's the folks that you're sleeping next to. How the enemy can use us. Oh, that don't happen. You just don't live in the right house. Because I'm telling you, most of us in here understand that the enemy will use anybody and anything that he can to attack us. Oftentimes people have the idea that the enemy attacks us where we are weak. He attacks our weak link. But I want to tell you something. That's not what he did with Samson. He attacked Samson where Samson was strong. He attacked him at the point of his strength, at the point of his, of his consecration, at the places in his life where he has fully surrendered himself to the lordship of Jehovah God, namely in three aspects of life, three areas of his daily walk. Samson was not attacked at his weakness, but rather at his strength, at the point of his devotion, at the point of his dedication, that is living the vow of a Nazarite. In the first place, the Bible teaches us that he was not to drink strong drink. Let me just step out here, and I mean no offense to you, what? Whatsoever. So, so, so just take this in the spirit that I say it. I am a teetotaler. 
all right? I know it's becoming popular, and I know more and more folks are saying, well, a little drink here and there, and social drinking won't hurt you. It might not hurt you, but I'm not willing to take the chance that it might hurt me, all right? So my dad, he's gone to heaven now four and a half years ago, but he gave me some real wonderful advice. He said, son, if you'll never take the first drink, you'll never get drunk. If you'll never take the first drink, you'll never become a drunkard and have to be delivered from it. And he, he, the amazing thing is, the older I get, the, the more sense my dad made. All right, he wasn't too smart when I was a kid, but he really got wise as I was getting older. And he told me those things. And the scripture says to us here that, that this was a part of a vow of a man who is a Nazarite. He was not to drink anything that was strong drink, no wine, no strong drink. But you said, well, what was the problem? No real problem except the crowd that Samson was choosing to identify with were known for their drunken party. He ran with the crowd of the Philistines in the camp of the Philistines. You say, did, did it really hang with us? Sure it did. Follow with me. The Bible teaches us that he is a, a Nazarite. He is a Danite. His father is from the household of Dan. He has been raised up that he was not to intermarry with the heathen nations, that he was not to accept their culture. He was to be separated because of his commitment to God. And yet you'll find the day dawned when that boy came back to his father and his mother, and I hear him say, Dad, I found the girl of my dream. She's everything that I could hope for. She's all that in a bag of chips. I love this girl, and she is all that I could hope for. That's fine, son. Now, which tribe does she come from? Can you imagine Manoah's shock and disgust? Now, can you see his jaw hit the ground when Samson said she is not an Israelite? Her parents are Philistines. She comes from a little village among the Philistines. He has fallen in love with a woman who is among the heathen. God, I wish I had a house full of teenagers and young marriage aged people uh, to let them know uh, that you owe it to yourself uh, if nobody else you owe it to yourself to date a believer can somebody yeah. say amen to that uh, you owe it to yourself to fall in love you'll never fall in love with somebody you didn't date all right and you'll never marry somebody that you have not come to to, to appreciate and love and know uh, but know this he has fallen for that girl uh, and he now is going to to marry Make his vows of fidelity to her. He's also going down into Gaza, one of their major cities, and he's hanging out with that crowd. He's even eventually gone to a prostitute in that place. He is running around with that crowd that is known for their drinking and wine bibbing to the point, I'm told, that these individuals would have their parties and they would drink so much that before the party got started, they've already gone out back and they have dug some pits where they can sit at the tables. They can drink and drink and eat and eat until they can't hold anymore and they will excuse themselves from the table to go out back. Hang with me here. They'll go out there and they will vomit until they empty their stomach and they'll go back to the tables and drink and drink and drink and continue it on. I'm here to tell you, I know a lot of church people I know a lot of preachers in pulpit that we won't drink out of a bottle and we won't drink out of a can. We don't drink wine and liquor and strong drink, but we allow ourselves to become drunk on this world and we become inebriated sitting too long at the tables of the ungodly and we're drunken in a drunken stupor and we're even crying out now with the drunk that my Lord is delaying his coming. It is an evil servant that falls prey to such and that's what where we find Samson. He's hanging out with the drunk crowd, with the drinking crowd, and this is where he's being attacked. You understand? That's where the devil attacks you, where you have made a vow to God that you're going to live a certain way. Am I making sense to somebody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let, let, me, let me put it to you like this, all right? Now, you can tell I am not undernourished, okay? <laughs> Do you know when 
I've come to a place that I'm saying, God, I want to get a hold of this thing. I, I'm going to I'm going to make a pledge that I'm not going to I'm not going to eat homemade bread. And do you know that's when somebody comes along with the very best homemade bread that you have ever smelled in your nostrils. When somebody who's hooked on cigarettes, they come to a place that they say, Lord, I'm through. I'm stopping. I'm not going to smoke anymore. That's when the crowd comes around. And they're asking you to go with them. And they're breathing and, and blowing in your face. And all of a sudden, that nicotine begins to pull at you. The moment that you say, I'm finished with drinking, I'm not going to drink anymore, that's when the drinking crowd comes around and calls you up and said, hey, we're all going wherever on Friday and Saturday, and we want you to be a part of it. That's the way the devil works. He brings attack upon us in the place where we have made strong commitments, where we have stomped our foot and said, I'm done with low living. I'm finished with the old way. I'm not going to live that way anymore. Rest assured, that's when the adversary is going to come and attack you. That's what he did with Samson with regard to strong drink and wine. God deliver us from our intoxication on passion and pride and pleasure and prestige and, and people. God deliver us. Secondly, his vow included the fact that he was not to touch dead things. And yet that's where the adversary attacks him is in the area of touching the dead things. You remember the story when he fell in love with the girl down in, in Timnath? And Samson says to his parents, I want to go down, let's make the wedding arrangements. They go through the vineyard of Timnath. All right, now follow with me. The scripture doesn't, doesn't get this explicit, but you follow it, and, 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 and common sense will draw this map for you. He's going through the vineyards of Timnath, and something happens that he goes one way, and his parents, the previous generation, went a different way. How do you know that? Because something happened that his mom and dad didn't know happened. While he is going this other path, didn't, he's not walking the way that the old folks are walking. He's not living the way that, that they have taught him to live. He's not obeying the commands that they have taught him and precepts that they have patterned for him. He's going down another path in the vineyard and suddenly a lion comes out, roars against him. It had to be the Holy Ghost came upon him and helped him to overcome the lion. And he takes the lion and shreds him and flings the dead beast over over in the bar ditch and goes on rejoicing about the goodness of God. Time out. Let me tell you this. Samson is not living like Samson ought to be living. But God anointed him nonetheless. Now hang with me here. God has touched a lot of folks who weren't living right. God has used a lot of people who weren't living right. What you and I must do is have discernment so that we don't fall prey to say, that person's not living according to scripture, but God has blessed that person. So it must be all right. I'll live the same way. God sends his blessings upon whomsoever he may desire. It rains upon the just and the unjust. The same blessing of rain that comes down and brings tomatoes on the most ungodly people garden also brings those tomatoes among the godly folks as well. And God touches folks. He has blessed a lot of preachers to preach who weren't living godly lives. He's touched a lot of singers to sing who were not living godly lives. But God touched Samson and Samson is finding out what it meant that God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance and the goodness of the Lord brings us to repentance. God is being good to Samson endeavoring to bring him back to his commitment where he would live godly and serve the Lord in righteousness and in true holiness. They get down to Timnath, they make the wedding arrangements, they're on their way back. Suddenly they part ways again. He is not accustomed to following the and the pattern of that previous generation. So they're walking the well-worn old path. 
path that they always walk. And he is coming down a new trail, a new generation of the church, if you will. And he gets to a very familiar part of the vineyard. It is a place that is very familiar. And he sees a little creature that's buzzing in the air. It's a honeybee. And he knows if there's a honeybee, there's bound to be a honey hive somewhere. And so he follows the bee. It brings him to that dead creature. And there is where his temptation takes place. You see, it's not the honey. It's the container where the hive is. Because the bees have made their hive there, if you will, in the rib cage of that, of that dead beast. And Samson now wants the sweetness of the honey. He doesn't want to defile himself, but he's willing to take the chance. Hear me tonight, church. I can't believe all of these fine points in this message, but I want you to know that there are some people who are willing to take a chance with their anointing. There are some folks who are willing to take risk with their, with their service to the Lord. And Samson was one of them. I can see him with the long stick. And there he is. You know, that, 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 that bone structure is being bleached out. The jackals and the vultures, the buzzards, they've already come. They picked all the flesh off of it. It's just dead bones and a little piece of skin hanging here and there. But Samson with the long stick is trying to job it in there and roll that honey hive out. He's willing to risk all that he has with God and all that God is in him because he's not to touch a dead thing. But there he's defiling himself because of his willingness to, to treat God and his anointing that way. He has touched, if you will, the dead thing. That's not the only occasion. A little bit later in Samson's life story, you will find that Samson has been bound up. And he cries out when his own men, his own fellows, have bound him up. Eventually, the Philistines come out of hiding and Samson is touched by God and he breaks out of those bindings and those cords, much like you would snap a toothpick between your thumb and your first two fingers and he just simply snaps out of that. It's like a, a piece of thread touched by a flame and he is now free. What does he do? He turns around and there is a jawbone. It is a new jawbone and there somebody recently has offered up a sacrifice. Understand, God has laid claim to the firstborn of every creature. And somebody apparently had a donkey that had a donkey, and that was her firstborn donkey. And the owner has to decide, am I going to give this to God according to the law, or according to the law, will I redeem this donkey? Apparently, he chose not to keep it. He twists and breaks its neck, offers it up as a sacrifice unto God. Thank the Lord for those who are living according to the teachings of the living God yes. and their sacrifices are providing blessings for others that come along in their pathway but on this occasion Samson makes a great error because he touches the dead bone and he is now defiled you see it's not so hard to defile yourself it's the, it's the fly in the ointment of the apostle that ruins the whole mixture. It's that little thought of pride that brings you down. It's that little giving in one time when you're at that place of temptation. That's what happened to Samson. And Samson is losing what he has had with God. Samson has had a powerful past and a lot of people, they are now becoming defiled because of their commitment or their relationship with a powerful past. There's a lot of us grew up in the church. How many of you did? I grew up in the church. That's all I've ever known. I have a preaching granny. She's up in heaven. My parents made me go to church when I knew I didn't need to go to church that much, but they made me go to church. Some of the best naps I ever got was sleeping right there while my grandmother's preaching her heart out, telling folks about Jesus. Some of the some of the great shenanigans that I've been involved in was that other kids who weren't living for God, <clears throat> like some of us were, they would pool their money and then they would put it in my hand as a second grader and younger, put it in my hand. And, and on the Lord's day, I'd slip out. I'd go down out of that pew onto the floor. I'd slide to the back row and I'd go through the open door and I'd go across the street, down the street, across the highway, and I'd buy candy and bring it 
back to everybody else there and had fooled their money. That's the way I grew up, all right? I'm not proud of that, but my folks didn't know I did all that till just a few years ago. But I, I, I know this, uh, that you and I who grew up in the church, we understand some things about church. We understand how it works and how it operates. We have seen the house in her first glory. We know what it is to see the power of God fall. We know what it is to see the tide of his presence rise. We've seen the glory of the Almighty fill the house and his mighty power comes and floods the temple. But how the scripture teaches us that many of us come to that place that we think about our past so much and how it was and how good it was and how great it was that we cease moving forward. I thank God for my heritage, but I cannot live in my past. I need this touch right now. And there we find that he is defiled by one dead bone or another on another occasion. It's a powerful past. And sometimes we get so caught up living in our past. Don't fall out with me here. I just want to tell you that I, I'm 57 and I can't live on what I had when I came into this thing and got saved at 8 and sanctified at 10 and spirit baptized at 16 and called to preach at 16 and for his life at 17, ordained at 19. I can't survive now on just what I had back then. I must have a fresh touch. I need a new anointing. I need a power from earth, from heaven, in my heart and in my life. It must take place. So we have to be aware that the adversary is out to attack us in every way possible. Move on to the third area of his consecration, and that was that he was never to have a razor to come upon his head. He was to allow the locks to grow. The Bible teaches us that he has gone into the house of Delilah. And just, if your name's Delilah, take no offense, but I just grew up hearing that name preached by preachers, and I thought, Ooh, anybody named Delilah must be a wicked woman. <laughs> Don't have to be, but she fit the bill. Now, follow with me. Here's Delilah, a decoy of the devil. She wants to know what is the source of your power? What makes you unlike the other men of Israel? What is it about you? What makes you so strong? Now, for what it's worth, I don't think Samson looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't, I don't think he had muscles bulging. Otherwise, she would have known. Oh, he works out three times a week in the gym. That's what makes him like nobody else. There's no reason to, to think what it would be that makes him so strong. And so he goes to her house. She's sitting on the end of the couch. What man doesn't like to lay on the couch with his head in the lap of his lover? And she's just running her fingers through the locks of his hair, saying, oh, big boy, there's nobody like you in the world. You're the biggest and the baddest and you're the best. And what, what is it that makes you so strong anyway? And he begins to disclose some things. Well, he's not telling her all of the story, but he begins to tell her some of his story. You know how that he says to her on one occasion, well, if you'll just tie me up with new vines that have, have never dried out, I'll be weak like anybody else. And he falls asleep and she ties him up and he comes alive when she says the Philistines are upon you. And what could he not do lie to her? Well, girl, if you'll just tie me up with new ropes that have never been used before. And she does that. You know this part of the story very well. Eventually, something happens. He is receiving something from Delilah that he's not getting from God. He's receiving something from her that satisfies him more than he was satisfied with what he's receiving from God. And there are people who are in church week after week, service after service, who are never satisfied in their relationship with God. They go through the motion, they sing the songs, they say amen, they pat each other on the back, they shake the preacher's hand, but in their spiritual relationship with God, they're getting nothing out of it. The Bible teaches us that eventually she says to him, you have lied with me, you have, you have not been truthful with me. You have, you have absolutely borne this message to me that is false. And he then begins to tell her, if you would just simply, 
weave the locks of my hair with the with the, the web. Just just give me the new do, Lord, and I'll do thee. Notice when he's done it progressively, he's becoming more and more a prey for her. Little by little, hear me, church. Little by little. sought God and pray. Right, right. But now, as a general rule, by the time that the last ones get to the altar, the first ones are leaving the altar, and we're wondering why we don't see the power of God move and fall and the glory fill the house like it one time did. The scripture says to us that ultimately, he says to her, if you will shave the locks of my hair, I'll be weak just like anybody else. And she perceived this. She perceived that he had just told her everything that was in, her, in his heart. She had more spiritual perception. She had more spiritual discernment right. than that Pentecostal boy. Yeah. Where is our discernment? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm preaching to you a little different, all right? I'm not, I'm not just running and stomping and you're not shouting me down. But, I, but we, we all know I'm pulling up close to the root system that you and I are, are drawing our strength out of. We've come to a time to where we, like Samson, are giving away our spiritual perception and our discernment. And yeah. that ungodly world out there oftentimes has better spiritual perceptivity than what you and I possess. God grant to us that we'll not fall prey as did Samson. Here he falls asleep again. He's got his lap, his head in her lap, and she's just, just making him fall asleep. Beware lest we fall asleep in the house of God. Beware lest we allow ourselves spiritually to fall asleep in the house of the Almighty. And the scripture teaches us that she now calls for a man to come from behind the grave. Now, I'm a hard sleeper. I don't mind telling you that. When I go, it takes me a while to get there. But when I go, I'm gone. I don't think, number one, I don't think my wife could get another man in my house and me not know. Number two, I don't think that I could go off into such a deep sleep that she can call that rascal to come from behind the drapes and me stay asleep the whole time while he's shaving my head. I just don't think that that's going to happen. But it's happening to a lot of people in the church world today. Are, are you okay? I'm not finished with the story. Can I, can I go ahead just, to, just a moment here? Here's, here's what happens. She cried out like she did before. The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And you know what he did? He got up. He shook himself. He, he, he contorted. You know how we Pentecostals do. We, we make our contortions with, with the bucket and shout and <laughs> carry on. We, 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 you let sing. some singers, they know when to get happy and throw them out and all the You let some preachers preach. They know when to stomp their foot and throw their arm and get the crowd whipped. Understand, she said, The Philistines be upon you. And you know what he said? No problem, girl. I'll go out like I always do. Yeah. I'll shimmy yeah. and shake, and I'll be Pentecostal, and I, I'll do the spiritual thing, and I'll defeat the adversary. And that's where a lot of Pentecostal people are today. They go through the routine, they go through the, the, the ritual, they go through the actions and the activity. But what happened was that God has backed away, letting him find out where he really is in his relationship. And now they come. He is bald. He has no glory and he has no power. And they cuff him in, in fetters of brass. He should have snapped those like you. You would that toothpick between your thumb and your fingers. And they now bring a steel poker out of the flame and they get it so close to his eyes that it dries up all the liquid and he goes blind. He is bald. He is bound. He is blind. That's where many Pentecostal people and churches are today. Void of power. Void of freedom. No liberty whatsoever. No vision. No insight. And they take him like a common being into the prison house. There where, where old Dagon, the great god of the Philippines,
Philistines half man and half fish. They are now making sport of him. They are laughing at Samson. Hear me, church. That ungodly world out there has laughed at us long enough. Somebody say amen to that. It is time for us to have a Holy Ghost revival. It is time for us to see the power of God fall upon us again. It's time for us to do some praying and get prayed through whether we can function with the anointing of the Spirit of our God. When the crowd is gathered, it's standing room only in the house. Thousands upon thousands are there, and they're chanting, Bring Samson. Let's laugh at him. Let's make fun of him. Let him make sport for us. The church has given plenty of ammunition for the would-be comedians to laugh at us and make fun of us. But this is an hour that we must get serious with God. This is a time when we must come clean before the God of heaven. This is a time that we've got to come to him and repent and believe and receive the power of God's spirit in our lives. They want Samson to come and snap logs. They want Samson to come and fling boulders in the sky and catch them. And they bring him from the prison house. Here's his picture. When they find him, he's, he's all bound and blind. He's going in a circle, just like a beast of burden. Kind of like church a lot of times, just yeah. going in a circle. Yeah. Just always going. Always doing, but never accomplishing. Always busy, but never fulfilling our destiny. But he is now summoned out into the arena of old Dagon. And they're cheering, and they're jeering, and they're laughing, and they're poking fun of him. And another generation is leading this Pentecostal out into the arena. God raise up another generation to help some of us who have faltered along the way. Amen. But here, Samson is coming out. He is still bound up and he is still blind. But the scripture said that his hair has began to grow. Amen. There's a God in heaven who is merciful. He was merciful to give Samson birth. He was merciful to help Samson when he was failing. And he's merciful now that Samson is in his dying day. Samson didn't know today was the last day that he would live in this world, but they take him out there, and he hears them laugh and jeer, and they're making fun of him, and he says, boy, take me to the place where the two pillars stand that are holding the great weight of the structure, and with that, I see him standing there, running his hands up and down those pillars, and he begins to pray, and he said, oh, Lord God, I sure have messed up. I haven't done everything Everything I should have done, I have failed you. I haven't prayed like I should have prayed. I have fasted like I should have fasted. I haven't lived like I should have lived. I have compromised. I have given in. I've done things I shouldn't have done. But I've come to my senses this day. I recognize that I need you. I've not done the will of God. I've not fulfilled my purpose. I've not accomplished my destiny. But would you just touch me one more time? And with that, he leans forward and he pushes.
Yes, Jesus. I want a greater glory to fill my heart, yes. fill my life, fill my family, fill my church, fill my ministry. Yes, Jesus. Oh, come on, let a greater glory fill us. Flood us. Yes, Jesus. Come down on us, please. Yes, Jesus. Come down on us. Yes, Jesus. Wednesday, and um, to all those that have come, the 
to the Watfords. Thank you for everybody that's come and helped us out to, to make tonight successful. And um, I just thank the Lord for what he has done in this house this evening. Father, we just pray that you go with us tonight. Lord, help us to spread the word of the Bible. Help us to spread the word of the fire of God that is falling. God, I thank you that we are in a true, spirit-filled, Holy Ghost-baptized house where we can feel and sense the power and the presence of God tonight. We're speaking in tongues. It's not strange to Hallelujah. us. Lord, it's common. We, this is what we've come to expect, uh, yes. is for your spirit to move. But, Lord, tonight you have moved mightily, and I recognize that. I recognize that you have moved mightily in this house tonight. Uh, I recognize, Lord, that there was a number of preachers, a lot of preachers that's in this house tonight. And, God, I believe you've touched these preachers in this house yes. tonight. Uh, Lord God, from Friendfield and from Effingham and from Barano and from all around the surrounding areas, God, I believe you have touched this house tonight. And Lord God, I believe that we're going to see the results and the fruit of this touch. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Be back tomorrow night, 7 o'clock.